This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. If you have your Bibles today, I want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. If I could give this message a title today, it would be Culture Wars, It's More Than Just Culture. Now over the past few years, Deuteronomy 32 starting with verse 8. And I'm going to be reading it out of the ESV today because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it actually has a more accurate translation than the King James does. We need to understand that culture is more than just the culture of a people. In both the writings of my books and what we've been studying with the Understanding the Kingdom series, we understand that there are three ways of attack from the enemy. The first one was in the garden where the Nachash came and said, you know what? The Creator shouldn't be the one who determines what's right and wrong. You should be. And I'm going to give you the power to decide for yourself as well as your own plan of salvation. And you'll be like gods in doing it. The second was Genesis 6 where some of the immortals that are a part of God's kingdom, the, the principalities and powers or watchers, came down. That's what the book of Enoch calls them, and they begin to breed with humans to create demigods, or we call them Nephilim. It's where we get the stories of Hercules and Zeus, and so many others are out of these hybrids that were born that were so bad that God had to destroy the earth with a flood. And then we come to the third wave of attack where Nimrod transmuted himself into becoming a hybrid Nephilim, and begin aligning with principalities and powers and rulers that were part of God's divine counsel that fell at the Tower of Babel. And man began to, to worship them and begin to look to them for power. And it's at the Tower of Babel that they rebelled. God came down and judged. God came down and said, I'm going to see what's really going on. And he confused their languages. Now in Deuteronomy 32, Noah, or Moses is retelling the story Deuteronomy is an interesting book. In, in Hebrew, it's Devarim, simply means words. It's the Reader Digest version of the first four books because he was preparing the next generation to go over to Jordan, and he didn't want them to miss the important parts of what they were being taught. And so from Moses' perspective, he picks up here in verse 8 dealing with the, uh, with the Tower of Babel incident. When the Most High God gave the nations their inheritance, when He divided mankind, He fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God, or the principalities and powers and rulers that had aligned themselves with what Nimrod was doing in Babylon. But the Lord's portion is His people, Jacob, His lauded inheritance, and it was out of Babylon that God called a man named Abraham, or Abram that became Abraham. It was at that moment that God divorced humanity. That's why there's this, this concept of, we, we find that he had divorced Ephraim, the northern tribes. But yet, 
out of Ephraim and, and out of the Gentiles and out of the Jewish people, Jesus is gathering a bride so that He can not only form a nation unto Himself, but for Him to remarry humanity once again. And it's only available through the shed blood of Jesus. But we need to understand that every culture now, uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the, the account of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, the next chapter, they list the descendants of Noah, which are 70. Now, I, and so many of them will say, well, there were 70 nations that were born. You look in the Talmud and say not only were there 70 nations born, but the rabbis teach there were 72. I've had a lot of people ask me, where does Freemasonry get the number 72? It's out of the Talmud where they taught there were 72 languages, even though there were only 70 nations. But what's interesting, my friend Derek Gilbert, and, and he loves to uh, go through all the, the new white papers, that the, the new archaeological digs and things they're discovering. And I'm so glad he's anointed to do it where I don't have to. I just need to read his books and, and I get to glean that. But he discovered that 70 is an interesting number in ancient literature because it means more than just 60 plus 1. Many times when they referred to 70, it meant all of them. So when it uses the number 70, what, what was being expressed is God divorced all humanity. And they were the ones, these principalities and powers and rulers, were the ones that worked with Nimrod to begin developing the culture of Babylon. That there's this symbiotic relationship. I get into this somewhat in my second book of the iniquity force. And the more that, that the kingdom of darkness can get a culture or a nation into sin, the more power that they can draw from it. And there was no cure to that until the cross. And when revival comes and people begin to repent, it begins to turn down the volume, if you will, on the kingdom of darkness. They begin losing power. And what's interesting, when you begin studying, and I've had to study a lot of occult writings trying to figure out the modus operandi of the enemy, when the power level goes down to a certain level, those principalities and powers will simply go to sleep. until some of their other agents are, they, they, they count on what I call spiritual entropy. The fire begins to burn out, and men begin to return to their old ways. And as that power accelerates, it begins to awaken them. They begin exert, exerting greater control over humanity. And so there's, this, but there's been this dichotomy, revival down, darkness up. Revival comes up, darkness down. And we're kind of in this one where the church has forgotten the whole level of warfare. We're in. If you ask the average Christian, what, uh, what spiritual warfare? Well, you know, I was really praising God, and I come out of church, and I had a flat tire. That devil, he, 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 he flattened my tire, just ruined my whole day. That's, spirit. That's not spiritual warfare. Well, the devil's messing up with my money. And I can't buy as much stuff as I used to. That's spiritual warfare. Well, that's maybe spiritual warfare in Laodicea, but not for the rest of the world. We're going to find out that, first of all, we have the spiritual warfare within driving out the ites. I've, I've taught about that so much. Once you get the ites out, second level spiritual warfare is becoming activists in the kingdom to begin influencing culture. That is a major component. And the body of Christ, we, we have forgotten that. We thought, you know, the, we, we were, you know, they, they, we have aspects over saying, you know, America was never a Christian nation. You have ones over here saying America was a Christian nation and so many of the founders were Christians. And then over here, so many of the founders were Masons. In other words, there was a double stream. There were two competing kingdoms from the very beginning. Now, in the establishing days of this nation, the church understood that. They understood that darkness always was knocking at the door, trying to contaminate and to destroy a culture. And you can look historically that there are certain what I call canary in the coal mine events or things that will begin raising up that mark 
that that culture is about to be destroyed by principalities and powers because we, we've seen it with the Roman Empire. We've seen it with the Grecian Empire. We've seen it with the Babylonian Empire. We've seen all these different things historically that can happen because once sin has completed its work, what does it bring forth? Death, okay? And so we see that in the individual. We can see that in the culture. The only reason that America has had the blessings that it has had and the protection it has had has not been because of Freemasonry. It's been because of God's covenant people that were walking in this nation and they were allowed the freedom to express truth and it began to affect the culture. As that is withdrawn, the blessing and the protection begin to wane with it. Because our enemy have activists that don't just play church. They don't just go through the motions. I was appalled this week at, at I'm, I'm sitting here going through the news feeds. And this one jumps out, and, and this is not, um, you would think this maybe would be, you know, protesting some of the abortion laws that are beginning to be overturned, or or immigrants or whatever, and it was over climate change. Okay, well, climate always changes. You can look historically. It goes up, it goes down. We, we don't realize that even during uh, 1776 when they were doing the Revolutionary War that we had a mini ice age. We actually had several summers where there was no summer. It snowed in July all across the nation. It was causing starvation, a lot of things, because of a volcano exploding. So there's all kinds of different changes and, and what, what they're calling global warming. But this woman was upset because they were beginning, they were beginning to get rowdy and, and they were beginning to be removed by the police. So she took her shirt off and glued her chest to the asphalt and is now scarred for life over a protest over climate change. You see, they're committed, even though they may be deranged, they may be what Sololinsky called useful idiots. Because they will topple a nation to put in a dictator that will make it hell on everybody. And we've seen that happen. We saw that happen in the Soviet Union. We've seen that happen in China. We've seen that happen in so many different places. And the church has lost its activism. It has lost the, the wrestling that we're supposed to do. That we are called to be salt and light in the earth. There's only two options here, church. Either we change the culture around us or the culture begins to change us. It's just the truth of the matter. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. So over, now the Masons have installed over America a principality that is a Baal. I know Dr. Benefield out of Oklahoma City has done a wonderful teaching on this and actually has some things where you can actually pray a prayer to divorce Baal. And uh, remember when there was an earthquake up in D.C. that cracked the Washington Monument? That was just within a week or so of him gathering Christians from all 50 states, and they gathered up at the Capitol and divorced Baal as representative of all 50 nations. And then all of a sudden, one of the major Masonic occult symbols was cracked which is essential for the coming Pharaoh that the leader planning on bringing forth. So how many know that confronting culture, confronting these things is so important? And if we'll listen to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God will give us the prayers that we need to pray. And Mary and I are so grateful that biblical life does not have to do it all. He raises up... <laughs> Uh, he raises up Russ Dizdar. He raises up Coach Dave. He raises up uh, Carl Gallup and so many others to do their portion of Jesus' ministry to awaken the church and begin affecting change in the culture. We've got to. If we do not affect culture, we as members of an extension of Jesus' ministry are a failure if we do not affect culture. Now, you need to set Ephesians chapter 6 back in the context in which it was written historically. Now, he wasn't writing to the Jewish community living in Judea. 
He was writing to all the Gentiles that all used to be pagan and the entire world, except for itty bitty Judah. Now Judah had problems even in the days of Jesus. It began blending stuff in. And today, uh, it, uh, even the scholars in Judaism will say that, that they're, what they teach now is not so much Moses, it's a blending of the rabbis and Hinduism and so many other things. In other words, they've gone native, just with a Jewish flavor, okay? But the nation that they were in, the, it was, everything was under Roman rule, everything was pagan. Every city had one or more temples to a pagan god or goddess. That leads back as they would enter in, it would strengthen and empower that principality and power over that city. Their entire culture was based on it. And when you go back and you, you research the culture, pedophilia was normal. Sex slaves were normal. Selling people you know, we're, we're, I, I get so upset when I hear the stories of all the human trafficking, and they've even found human trafficking now. They're using the immigration across our southern border as a way to traffic children out of South America for all the pedophiles in America. Uh, yeah, we need to build a wall. We need to help these kids. Help get them free of this stuff and get them to where they can be raised in loving, good homes that they could have a future and not be an object of somebody's sexual perversion. We have all these things going on. And the church sat silent. We have paganism raising up, just like it was. I was talking, I did an interview with Mike Spalding, I, and Carl Techrib, and his book, The Game of Gods, is an outstanding book. But one of the things in our conversation that we drew up, I remember being raised Southern Baptist, Missionary Baptist, and everybody was saying, oh, just to return to the book of Acts. If we could just return to the book of Acts. The book of Acts is set in a world where paganism was the dominant religion. Where you could own people that you couldn't even go down and buy a meal without when that when out that cow the chicken or pig or whatever that you ate was sacrificed to an idol for the prosperity of that restaurant it got so bad that the apostle paul said listen you're living in a culture unless you go find a good jewish restaurant okay i'm sounding italian but i'm trying to sound jewish that's it, it takes a special anointing for me to be able to do to do accents that you couldn't eat. You couldn't even go down to the butcher and buy a good steak because it had been sacrificed to a pagan god. And so finally Paul said, listen, in your situation, don't ask, don't tell, okay? Just don't ask. Just pray over it, break the curse of it, because otherwise you're going to become a vegetarian and hoping that the gardener didn't pull them out by the power of Ra or something when they pull them up out of the ground. That's how pagan those cultures were. Now imagine, okay, I was a follower of, of Diana my whole life, and my whole family's involved in her worship, and she has feast days, she has these holidays that the whole city, you would publicly go and do things. Many times going with the winter solstice and the summer solstice and the equinoxes and all these different things, all is a part of it, and they had their ways and then you get saved and called out of that. You want to talk about sticking out like a sore thumb. Your family gets mad. That's what a lot of people miss when they read in, in uh, Colossia. They think this is all Judaizers. No, it wasn't. A good portion of it was paganizers. What are you doing doing the Sabbaths and doing the new moons? You're just trying to be a Jew. Come back here and be a pagan with us. Otherwise, you can't be a part of the family. Oh, Mike, that doesn't happen. I was raised Baptist, okay? You have, you have Charlie the bar goer. And he wants his boys to drink, drive a pickup truck, chase women. 
One of his sons gets religion. What you mean you're not going to go down to the bar with me? Are you too good for my beer? Well, we've not heard that in the Ozarks, have we? We've heard, hold my beer, and then all of a sudden crazy things start happening when they're trying to help. And so, even as a young Baptist man, I saw young guys get saved. Their families ostracized them. You're just a, a Jesus freak. And whole families would ostracize them. But over time, you see, they were trained, you don't let that affect you, you affect that. You affect the culture. One by one, they would start getting family members saved. Now, imagine Uncle Charlie. Whole family saved but him. How many know he has a target on his back because everybody's praying for him? Then having their churches pray for him to get saved. All of a sudden, the beer don't taste as sweet as it used to. And uh, every time he goes to the bar, somebody wants to knock him out. And... <laughs> You know, because, I mean, when the Holy Ghost gets after you, it's rough. You got to, I'm, being, I'm getting the convictions now. It's just absolutely, I can't hardly breathe because of the conviction blues. And the only way that you can find any relief and to get these people to quit praying for you is to go to church, go down to the altar, make Jesus the Lord of your life. We need to return to that. But we can't. Because we forgot about the wrestling. Let me read Deuteronomy six, or, or, or Ephesians 6. We're not going to get into this. This was not written about the devil stealing money from you. Or keeping you from getting a new car. Or keeping you from a new job. This is not what this is written in context with. It's written in context that once you start walking in the kingdom, the entire culture is against you. And it's being empowered by principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. Because in Ephesus was the place where Paul was ministering. And the idol makers began to get upset because he began to affect their mularu. Okay? Prophets are going down. All these Christians or having yard sales, giving away their, their idols to die, and say, we can't have them, so I can't sell any new ones, all these different things going on. And they cause a riot, where for hours, all the men of the city cried out, great is Diana. And the guy that was in charge of the city realized, if I don't settle this thing quickly, they're going to raise up and slaughter all these Christians to include the Apostle Paul. And he was able to settle it down. But how I many know it was like this close? And so you have to take that into context when you read Ephesians chapter 6. Because eventually Paul left. And here's this fledgling church that at any moment they could have another great as Diana episode where none of them survive. And so after he teaches them who they are in Christ, and Ephesians is a powerful book, and one of the reasons it's one of the most powerful writings the Apostle Paul ever wrote is because it was on top of him going there and teaching for three years every day. So these were graduates of the school of Paul that he writes an advanced letter to because of the situation they're in. That's why there's such depth to it. It says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not. Underline that wrestle in your Bibles. If you're not wrestling, you're not living for God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Now the King James and New King James add hosts there. That's in italics. Against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, and I believe that is the dark river of the iniquity force. 
But the Apostle Paul was writing about the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. There are principalities and powers of rulers of darkness over Western society that are now in ascension because the church went to sleep in Laodicea. We're too worried about the best life now. We're too worried about looking as acceptable to the world. There has, there has, over the last 100 years, we have, instead of being, the only, the only, the only significance that the body of Christ has is our difference from the world. That is what makes us relevant. We're of another kingdom, walking by new principles, walking by a different drumbeat, talking about transformation, getting free from all that junk, and now walking whole in Christ, and walking free of those bondages and, this, and, the, and the influences of culture that destroy homes, it destroys families, it destroys destiny, it destroys purpose, and it brings you under the bondage of the enemy. Okay? The church used to know that. But when you quit preaching the gospel of the kingdom, you stop preaching holiness, you stop preaching the cross. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans. As the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up discern the times, and be infused with heaven's power to withstand The Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.